What is up? What is up? Welcome to the eighth episode of Money Trees. I am your host, Khufu, K-H-U-F-U, joined by what I can only, or who I can only describe as a mega talented designer out of North Carolina, my guy, Solomon Key. How you doing, Saul? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Um, super excited to be here. Yo, man. Thank you. Thank you for joining. We're taping a little later than normal. You are literally coming fresh out of work to come and chop up. So I appreciate you making that time. You've had quite an adventure, man. You were out in New York for New Year's. And, you know, we unfortunately didn't get to link up while you were here. But didn't you just get back to North Carolina today? <laughs> I just got back last night at uh, about 10 p.m. I was stuck in D.C. for two days and spent about half of that time in the airport. <laughs> Bro, that is not the way to start the year at all, man. What, what was going on? I mean, you would have thought it was like a damn zombie infection, the way they were acting about Jeez. You know, COVID. Um, COVID, the snow, it was just a perfect storm, you know, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, the, the late flights, the roads were closed, the trains were closed. American Airlines was pretty much, well, I don't want to name drop, but they were pretty much like, fuck you. Yeah, it's too late now. Can I curse on you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. You're good. You're good. (laughs) I don't. I'm. I don't have a sailor's mouth, but nah. It's funny. I'd be thinking about that because I'll listen to playback and I'm like, (laughs) damn. Like I had like the last time, uh, I said super and ill way too much, and so when I curse, I try to make sure it's just it's needed. You know what I mean? So it doesn't lose its emphasis. Where I'm not just cursing for the sake of cursing. Like when you hear the fuck, it's got it's got a nice nice kick to it. So curse as as you see fit. I will. <laughs> I curse as I see fit. So would you have, uh, would you have rather been stuck the in the my fault? Would you have rather been stuck in the airport the way you were, or did you see what happened with those people on I ninety five, where they were in their cars on the highway for something like twenty two hours? I'm gonna be honest when I um. I was totally unaware that it was that bad until so I got back. I got into a hotel finally and I turned it on and saw the news and I instantly, you know, had to be grateful that I wasn't out there. I mean, there was, you got to think there's old women and children. Um, I heard there was a woman with twins, six months each, and um, they were stuck in the car, man. And um, instantly it was a lot more grateful that I was able to be in a hotel. I would agree because I feel like when I heard you talking about the airport piece and I'm just like, damn, bro, like you're getting trapped outside of the city. You could have just crashed with me for an extra day or two, let all of this calm down. And then I saw the I-95 thing and I was just like, yo, what is up with transportation? But that was a different situation. That's like the roads and the storm. It's crazy to me, though, that because it was an accident plus the storm or something like that that caused that backup. But just the fact that it took everyone so long to get out kind of blew my mind. And I still don't know how they were able to fix that. Like, I don't know if the weather just got better or if they had emergency services clearing people out. I mean, they were pretty much playing catch up is what it looked like. They were still letting people onto the highway the next morning, which was a wild thing. I mean, I was just perplexed because, you know, if this had happened in Charlotte, where I'm from, you know, maybe. But I was completely baffled that this happened in D.C. I'm like, it snows here like every time. I'm, You know what I mean? It always snows there. I remember the first time I was in Charlotte, junior year of high school, and there was maybe like an inch and a half of snow on the ground, and they declared a state of emergency and canceled school. And I just wasn't used to that at all coming from the north. Like I was just like, damn, y'all are not ready for this. So, yeah, I'm surprised as well that D.C. Well, so, but but we, we pick our battles, though, you know? Charlotte, we already know we ain't going to spend all that money on salt and shit. We <laughs> close everything down. <laughs> You're like, yo, fuck it, y'all. City, city is clipped, man. Like, this is it. Everybody go home. Take a personal day. We'll, re- we'll really link, um, regather ourselves in about two days. <laughs> Has it snowed in Charlotte yet? It actually hasn't. Okay, yeah. I think it snowed a little bit here on Christmas Day, but we haven't gotten it like crazy in the city yet. It was uh, 65 on Christmas. T-shirt weather. 
conversation for another day with what's happening yeah. here. But um, <laughs> yo, speaking on t-shirts, my G. When is, when is my when is my coterie gear coming in? I'm gonna have to be honest, man. It's just um, it's coming, but it's uh, it's in due time. You know, um, just really taking a step back um, in the wake of uh, COVID, because although it slowed a lot of things down nationally, it also created this insane uptick in um, small businesses. Yeah, and um, and I just I can't be out here like that making t-shirts and hoodies. Not to say that it's wrong. I mean, it's really great for the culture, but for an industry that was already oversaturated, it's just become DIY as fuck. And, um, there's no uniqueness. Um, but you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a pro pros and cons to it, man. So I've just decided, you know, until I can put something out, that's truly like a statement. Yeah. I just, I am scrapped everything, you know, and just put things on hold. So can you talk about Coterie, this like the birth of that brand and just kind of what you're doing as a designer? Because that, that's really it. I, I know that, you know, not to spoil what you're going to start, but just I've been seeing some of the hats and I don't know if you're still making those as often. But one of the things that drew me to you was just your eye. And the way that you approach pieces, like even hearing you say this, that, you know, you, you, why you fell back, none of that surprises me because it's always been about the quality for you and not necessarily having something that's fast to market or a quickly made product. Like, you know, you want it to be something where when it touches your hands, it feel like, you know, there's an experience associated with that. And I've always kind of got that, you know, I don't want to call it like high brow, but you got taste, man. And so I've appreciated that. COVID made you take the step back. Where are you currently seeing your future? And like, what are you working towards in the moment? Um, well, I probably, um, I'm working on a couple of passion pieces right now. Um, a lot of them are still on the iPad and Procreate. But uh, as far as like what I've been doing now, is just really just learning taking a step back, reading, getting into architecture, just, you know, just consuming, you know, it takes a lot of nothing to create something really nice and um, it takes a lot of bad ideas. So I'm kind of just getting the willies out um, in my free time. I've been doing a lot of 3D stuff, trying to educate myself on um, NFTs, just culture and art, you know, just think about the state of people. I think that's what it all comes down to. Um, is uh, just looking at society and thinking about just thinking about it. And then when you make something, it's really just an opinion. Fashion's really just it's basically an opinion, and everyone has one. And right now, a lot of people are saying the, almost the same shit. So you know, that's why you know I don't knock it, but at the same time, it's like I can't be coming out my all into something and people assume that you know i'm just doing some regular shit yeah you want it to be reflective of i I keep saying that word feel but how you feel and how when you make something that you know is different that there's a feeling behind that when it's like i this is this is something this is something i can put my stamp on and i can put out in the world and people are going to rock with it because it's of me and it's of me, you know, in the time that we're currently in. And I, I, yeah, I get that. You mentioned yeah, that so, you're getting into, oh no, what's up? Yeah. So just, you know, for example, just, you know, I don't want to just throw Coterie to the side. Uh, so we did the, we did the, which you can't do out. because it's fire, yeah. bro. Like, <laughs> I hear you saying you don't want it to be like anything else that's out. And I'm in my head, like, this is motherfucker not see his designs. Like, <laughs> We cooked the we cooked I cooked the joy of missing out hat uh on my trip to Japan. And just the story behind it is um they were printing on my auto blanks. There's no reason in keeping it down pat anymore. Everyone's doing it. But uh this is back in I think October 20, 2019. So before all the COVID stuff started, I was over in Japan, I caught this capital hat and I was over there by myself. You know, and that's a big trip to take, you know, at you know, 20 years old. Dolo. That's huge. That's huge. Um, you know, that's 23 hours across the world, a full day ahead. And, you know, it was all just about like 
joy of missing out. Like, even though motherfuckers are doing X, Y, and Z during winter break, I'm out here fucking tripping ass in Tokyo, you know, having a great time missing out, just experiencing life. And that was the whole message behind it. And I, I caught, that was one of the only things I could afford from Capital was those goddamn trucker hats that are now, everybody knows about them. And so I started right from there, boom. But it's like, you don't see that, you know, looking at it now, because nowadays you see everyone's doing the foam joints. Like, it's just huge now, which is crazy, you know? You were the first person I ever saw with that. I can 100% say that. It's wild hearing the origin of Joy of Missing Out, because now that I think back on it, I didn't even realize you were in Japan until one of your last days there. Like, I really didn't even see, like, it wasn't like you were crazy flaunting on the stories or trying to make it a flex. And then you told me, and I'm like, oh, shit. Like, and again, you're right, the age going solo, it was really about that experience and not having to show people that you're having fun, just actually having fun, which I think is a lost art, (laughs) funny enough to say, with social media, where a lot of times you go out somewhere and people are just constantly on their phones and showing people what they're doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just hope that those same people are actually taking a second to not be on the phone and just experience it. Like, it's great that you're sharing it with me. I live, tell people I live vicariously through their stories all the time when I don't go out. But it's like, yo, I hope you're enjoying it. No, yeah. I mean, there's definitely some trade-offs and there's some some realizations that come from it. Because, you know, and we can segue into, you know, the next portion using this statement. And that's that with us being on our phones, nine nine hours a day screen time, it's like we're already in the metaverse, basically. Like, it's a part of our existence already. So, you know, you can't really, you know, knock anybody because we're all doing it. But at the same time, it's the the further we, we get into this metaverse, you see it as like people, it's, it's like it's harder for them to find some sort of independence. It's like everyone's trying to, like, be the main character and shit. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just this weird thing going on and I'm kind of trying to just kick to the side, you know, just figure some other shit out so I can bless the world, you know, cause ultimately, yeah. you know, you want to show people some, you want to give a gift to people, you know, take a step back, find some things that you think are cool, bring it back to the public, sell it, you know, inspire other people. But as of now, it's like ain't shit inspiring people just flex <laughs> you said even, something bro they even know. flex their like healthy lifestyle bro not to cut you off it's like no you're good even though they're showing some holistic it's like you, it still feels like a flex and that's why everybody feels like ass now bro it's everything's a constant flex on the other person it's just it's ingenuine honestly bro that's man <laughs> there's so many things i want to say to add on to that but i think that You said it earlier, your approach to the art to me is really fire. And I think it speaks to your output and just the way you go about it. But the fact that you do see yourself as a consumer now and being able to even see the different points where it's like, yo, no, I'm not in creator mode right now. Like I am just here experiencing different cultures and I think it's oversaturated and that's okay. Like it's okay to not create sometimes. That doesn't change your status of who you are at your core. It doesn't change the way you need to think about yourself because if you're constantly trying to create, you can get caught in that like rat race and then it's just like you said you lose your independence because you're trying you don't even know why you're trying to do these things anymore one of the dope things with web3 is this idea of community and this idea of like being a part of something larger than yourself that is borderless but still has a lot of value whether it's a dao or like a profile picture project or any other tokenized community doesn't have to be tokens that are financial like they're social tokens all of this stuff right So I'm listening to you talk and I think about how despite the lack of coterie uh, apparel that that I can purchase, the – how do I want to say this? Like don't think of it as a cult, but there's a mindset that you have and you're kind of like a thought leader, right? Not kind of. You are. And there are people that still want to engage with you, still want to be a part of that and hear from you. And I don't know if you've really done any talk show 
type things like this before, but you're making some really profound points. And so I'm thinking like, damn, like, okay, what if you had, or, well, let me backtrack and we'll, we'll, we'll get into this. Have you seen any Web3 or NFT fashion examples that inspire you? Mm, I wouldn't say really inspired me. Um, I took a course on like, on a, I forgot what that the app was called, but I, I learned all about NFTs. But something that I saw that kind of reminded me of some an idea I had was the Meta Birkins. And they got exactly what I thought I would get. Um, it's kind of interesting. I was going to start dropping, this is back in like October. I yeah. was going to start dropping like sneakers, just my favorite stuff, 3D design in them, um, Yeezy boots, shit like that, full um, replica, but in 3D and drop them the same day they drop or the day before. Um, and it's funny, you see the guy, uh, I forget his name, but he does the Meta Birkins. And I think he just got a cease and desist. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, see that, that to me is, there's a lot of that kind of derivative work that happens in the space where it's like, oh, they, they made an Olive Garden project where people just took all the pictures of Olive Garden and turned it into <laughs> NFTs. And I'm almost 100% sure the people who started that project are not the ones who took the picture. And I don't know if they have the licenses to it or not, but I think you were on the right track with the 3D models of the sneakers, right? So I'm going to send you probably, I don't want to say my overall favorite because there's a couple, but there's this girl, Zoe Steckel. And it's funny, we actually have the same heritage. So she's from Holland now and has a bag brand. And in order for you to be able to shop with her, you have to own one of her blueprint NFTs. And damn, but then also at the same time, it creates community. <laughs> You're like, wait a second, there's a barrier to buy. Just, uh, <laughs> we already we, we already got to deal with the bots and shit. <laughs> but this is but when you think about it, right? This is kind of anti-bot where she can see everyone that owns the NFT. And, okay, you can't confirm that somebody won't just buy and buy the NFT and then go buy the project, but you can do something where it's like, and I don't know if this is in her store, but just the idea of like, oh, if you own an NFT, you're only eligible to purchase five items. Can I and that could be the limit. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I want to, um, this I want to, me... I want to finish outlining it though real quick. I want to say one okay, thing. Okay, so, okay. um, so you have this kind of bot protection in, but my whole point of it was just a community, right? And it starts to create this other layer of interaction that you have with your favorite designers where they don't necessarily have to worry about trying to sell to the masses or trying to appeal to a much larger audience where it's like you have this core batch of people that love your work and love your content and you can just drop shit for them. And so I think that that is an like to me, that's like that should be. Insp- oh no, let me say it should be inspiring. When I saw that, that got me thinking on a bunch of different ways to run clothing communities. But let me hear what you were about to say. I was gonna say that you know, obviously, I love that. You know, after hearing you break it down, instantly started thinking of uh, that. That will kind of. It's not like a gatekeep, but it's like a two-step verification in real time. It's like, motherfucker, you want to be down. You really got to like this shit. You can't just be in it for the hype. And if you are in it for the hype, it's like, you know, put a little more effort in. Show that you really care. You I know? think of it like memberships, right? You know, I go to Soho House and then in oh order to God. go to the restaurant. <laughs> well, I know you were at Ludlow, bro. That's why I said that. <laughs> like, you were seeing bro. it. You were seeing it, bro. Like, oh, my God. An instant fan. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, wait a second, bro. Like. How do you even get into this? And that becomes the thing. When you start creating pieces that are unique, like my favorite, absolute favorite designer, there is nobody that I have more pieces of, is Fred Foster, who has Cease and Desist. And it's in my Avi. The only like pictures I ever take that are anything fashion related, you can almost bet that I have a Cease and Desist piece on. And I love his work. And so anything related to that, yo, I'm copying to further increase my access there. And that's just me, right? There may only be a thousand other people like me or 10,000 or whatever the limit is, but I want to interact with him more than 
the current fan does. And so these types of NFT gated projects become interesting. Um, have you seen, have you ever heard of the artist named Ferocious? Like Ferocious, but with a W instead of an R? Uh, I can't say I have. Okay. So Ferocious is really, really cool artist. And he did a project um, with Artifact Studios. And what they did was they sold an, like an NFT of a 3D virtual sneaker. And you had the option, I believe you had to burn the NFT to get the actual sneaker. So you had to destroy your NFT. And if you destroyed it, and when you, when it's, when you say burn, you can't really like delete its history, but it exists from the mint point until the burn point. So once it's burned, it can no longer be traded or accessed. But the yeah. history of having the NFT is still there. So let's say you bought this NFT and you were like, yo, I'm going to burn it. And by burning it, that allowed you to claim one pair of the sneakers. And I'm like, damn, that's a pretty interesting, like, um, just in, like fan interaction and a pretty interested sale method. So you start thinking about something like, you know, Yeezy raffles or Coterie raffles or whatever your next brand raffles are. And it's like, yo, we're giving away. 25 nfts people may just hold the nfts they may say nah i want to collect it here i'm never actually going to redeem this and some people will redeem it you know that affects the supply and that affects Uh. there's different game theory that then goes into that where it's like oh man do i burn it and get the physical or do i keep it do you as the designer put a limit on when they can redeem it where it's like yo if you don't redeem it within a year then it's gone forever um like it, little things. And so those are it. two examples that when I hear you say there's nothing that it's inspired you yet, I definitely just want to tap you in with those. There's some more that I'll send you offline. But when I think mm-hmm. about you and just these really, really tailored experiences, we'll say, you have another hat that I love, crying at the orgy. <laughs> and big time. Big time. Yo, that's just such a funny concept. Like, the visual of it is hilarious. Rocking that around as a hat, it reminds me of the um, the what you see in Chinatown, where it's yeah. like the super crude uh, t-shirts that you're like, do you realize what this even says? Where it's like, fuck you, and that's yeah. just all that it says <laughs> on the shirt. Very like, yo, what the hell? But it's tongue in cheek for some people. Other people are oblivious to it. But that type of humor. Um, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent on why I love the crying at the orgy hat. <laughs> But I Thank think you. about things like, yeah, for sure, G. Uh, so much that you do that you cook up is really, really ill. Not to go off on another tangent, but that's the reason why I wanted – this is the reason why the guest list is the way that it is for Money Trees. But even why I started this up is that I'm around and having some conversations with, in my opinion, some of the most talented people in the world. And they just haven't quite gotten the opportunity, whether it's platform-based or like, you know, you're literally – Finish, like you just finished school and it's that type of uh, – like you're young and there's no one, there's no place for you to look back and point and say, yo, I said I was going to do this and then I did it. I wholeheartedly believe all these people that come on and visit and that I talk with, I'm going to be able to look back in five years and say like, damn, look how many more of them – were where they were at when we spoke and are incredibly successful now. And we'll have that moment of seeing all that materialize just because like all of y'all are genuinely talented, man. So yes, you know, tangent, but back to (laughs) just back to speaking on inspiration with the NFTs, with web three, you're in a place now where I haven't seen much from the fashion angle and we, there's a whole other bag for us to get into. It's Uh, coming. It's coming. You see well, Adidas. I, yo, the, yo, the Adidas collab is very interesting. The gated merch drops are very interesting. But I also think about things like wearables and then skins, right? Where, oh, yeah. Come on, bro. Now the you start licensing out. Yes, yes, yes. You start licensing out your designs and your clothes in a different way. And it's like, yo, digital scarcity. Okay, how is it scarce if you can just copy it? Well, it's scarce because the code says it is. And then you have a Fortnite skin that not everyone can buy. And it's like, yo, yeah, you have to own this NFT and then you get it for free. Or you have to own this NFT and then you purchase it. 
or like, you know, the idea of these virtual storefronts is another really ill layer. Think about the fact that when you, you know, our online shopping experience has pretty much been the exact same for the past 20 years. You know what I mean? Like the design of it store to store hasn't really changed much from when I was first on the internet. And so my guys over at Muse, oh, now what's up? My bad, my my um, AirPods just died. I mean, yeah, it's been the same since I'd say fucking American apparel went out of business. <laughs> they, they were not. <laughs> um, and they yo, are they out of business? Like I know they did, but I can still order. No, nah, they were bought by uh by Gildan, and um now they do wholesale. And the original owner switched over. He's got okay. Los Angeles now apparel. Okay. Okay. Um, Anyway, so thinking on like the ver- like storefronts having been the same. So Muse is working on it, and I think there's other places that are doing similar things. But I love walking in. One of my favorite things about being in New York is being able to walk into some of these flagship stores that have really ill architecture and really unique ways of displaying the clothes. And I think about something like the Supreme store, right? Where imagine if you, instead of going on the Supreme and seeing just the regular paneled images, imagine when you went on there, it was a more VR experience. So you're able to actually walk in and see the store the way it looks in New York or in LA, maybe even get into the skate bowl that's in the back of the store and have like a mini game associated with it. And you can buy your pieces and actually see them virtually. Maybe there's a way to, you know, try it with AR or with VR and then you start putting it on mannequins or you're trying it on yourself and looking at it looking at it in a mirror. And we start getting to all these really really interesting use cases of how NFTs, blockchain, VR, AR is going to change the way that we shop. Now, for some people, it's like, yo, like I don't want to do any of that. I just want the simple thing. And we can figure out what that looks like in a revamped way for them too. But for the people that do want another layer, I think that that would be so cool. Like I look at the uh, luxury brand stores. Like you said you were in Japan. I know that there's designers who build stores that are one of ones specifically for locations. Uh, like at the Louis store that Virgil had worked on. When I saw the design of that, I'm just like, yo, this is crazy. And if I could never get to the actual store, touring it virtually kind of becomes the next best option. Yeah. I mean, that the Mykonos store was fucking insane. That thing was, uh, I think it was the all blue one he Mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it just opens up a whole nother layer uh, where money can be made, you know, profit margins and, be insane pretty much (laughs) i think profit for sure but i'd say it's it's that experience man like to me it really is that like how does it feel to go through and purchase this like i love amazon because of the two day one day delivery people please don't kill me like i'm sorry i love my packages getting here fast i know that they have issues and they need to work on it but let me not say that i love the speed at which amazon delivers like i don't love amazon it's a mega national or multinational corporation but i I digress amazon's ui is terrible like i i don't get it it's been the same for forever but they have no reason to fix it or to update it like if you use prime video it is easily the worst ui or fucking like hbo max's thing doesn't even work you said and it's ugly (laughs) pretty ugly i mean i don't like netflix's ui i mean there's, oh it's, what? It's, no, it's, Netflix's UI is cold, bro. It's so constricted. It's just fucking. Flu- it, I don't know. They've been. They need to switch it up. I feel like it's too constricted in how you can browse. In a way. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. Look, even that differences of opinions are okay. I, yeah, I fuck with the Netflix. The Netflix UI. Um, oh my gosh, I'm losing my point. Oh, I was thinking. On, I was talking on experience, right? So, but even that, when I load up Netflix and the little N. You know, animates and the boom boom or the to dum as they call it happens. That changes like the layer of experience, and I think it's going to be interesting as brands start to figure out ways to compete because artists are going to start blowing it out the water. Going back to like the Zoe example, her bags are also fire, 
But the fact that if you want to own one of these bags, you have to have the NFT, that creates a demand for that NFT. And oh, if she only does season runs, I don't know how the the supply of it works, but it's like, yo, you could have seasons and you have access to the fall and winter 21 season from buy, or 22 season by buying an NFT or whatever it is. It's like a new sandbox. I keep saying that word, but it's a new way for you to set this up. And to me, that's exciting. And someone like you that has the level of vision that you do, you need to get into the space now and start paying attention to some of these examples because you can plant seeds, no pun intended, money trees. <laughs> you can start planting seeds now. And also you're just, you're super young, bro. So this is the space for you to be exploring. And you sent me that 3D house that you made. I think that was in Procreate. And you start thinking about like, yo, you could design your own virtual store and sell real physical products like that. And it becomes a thing of like, oh, you find the place like Muse or, you know, an Oculus app and you design a, um, a VR spot that people can actually walk into and shop your place and shop your items. I don't know if that inspires you, but at least it's a new option. At least it's something new. And I tell you right now, there are people trying it, but it's nowhere near as oversaturated as the standard like DIY merchant apparel, um, like drop shipping businesses right now in web two. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. I just, I wonder how, how exponentially fast this all is going to grow or exponentially is going to grow because right now I feel like the game is, is still a little gimmicky every NFT. And that's, what's kind of like stifled me. I feel like I got to have some sort of a gimmick or something like that. Nah, don't think of it as a gimmick. Think of it as an angle. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing where I talk about perception a lot, where there's a very thin line of the thin line between love and hate. But uh, yeah, my, my brain be going out places. <laughs> there's a very thin <laughs> line between like being cheesy and being gimmicky and having a story that connects. Right. And it's a lot of it starts with your intention, where if you are doing something for the sake of only gaining attention, then it will likely come across gimmicky because you're not doing something that's of you, that's not of your soul. And you know, from whatever it is that you believe to be good or to be art or to be whatever that word is for you, like if you're doing it solely for attention, a lot of times it will come across as a gimmick. If you figured out your narrative and the story that you want to tell, and the way in a way that that's true to you, I know that sounds super cliche, but it won't feel like a gimmick to the people once they dive into it. And you know, there's no guarantee. Some people may say that it is what it is, but people are always going to talk. You could have the greatest idea in the world, and people will call it bullshit and call it a gimmick. You know, you once you get so popular, everything you do becomes a gimmick. Nobody believes that anything is original let me and i don't i try to avoid sweeping generalization so let me not say nobody <laughs> but there will still be people that will call it a gimmick so you can't worry about that you have to make sure for yourself it doesn't feel like a gimmick so when i think about your angle when i think about your story it becomes you know we don't have to super dive into that now but you talked about the origin of coterie and just the idea of the collective and the idea of being able to create a collective that empowers artists. And people yeah. say that all the time, but your angle was different. Your practice of it was different. The way you went about it was different. And so to me, it, it can't come across as a gimmick as long as you stay true to those same you know, tenets that you brought up to me when we first spoke. No, yeah. Coterie is it's just basically... It's just so many crabs in the barrel, um, at least, you know, being in, as far as artists go, that I really just kind of made it. It's kind of sad. I just made it to have some friends, some homies uh, uh, to create together. We didn't have to all make the same thing or have the same brand, but, you know, you get together, make coterie, and uh, be able to learn and produce, you know. Um, this is before... Uh, the DIY boom also though. Like this is back where like I was scraping the bottom of the pot trying to figure out where am I going to print my clothes, like trying to get people to teach me how to sew. And, you know, I fought tooth and nail to learn this stuff, um, working for free, 
doing all kinds of things. And, um, and yeah, so I was like, you know, there should be a place, there should be a group or some type of service that can be provided by a business where they just make all this stuff easy to you. Like it never made sense to me why in 2018, when I started, I'm like, why can't I just Google a place to get my shit made from scratch? Why I got to go on Alibaba <laughs> and, fun, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. translate the emails and shit. Why can't I just, it just blew my mind. I'm like, how is this, this thing so gatekeep right now? I laughed because this is literally the philosophy of DAOs now. Yeah. <laughs> and the idea of democratizing the access to, you know, whatever it is in the industry. And there's a whole bunch of different kind of um, verticals where they operate. Oh, God, I just said so many buzzwords in that sentence. Uh, <laughs> so speaking on DAOs, that is a – that is part of the reason why I felt like you needed to get into this because you've had – this desire and started building something similar. I'm not saying that you need to start a DAO. I don't think that you should. I still think that they have a lot of um, things to work through. Oh, yeah. But your brand, Coterie, embody the spirit of Web3. And it was, you said 2018, not that Web3 wasn't around. It was in its infancy. But you had, there was no NFT input in you trying to des- trying to design this. And you're still at a point where it's early enough in your brand and in this space that you can start to learn about what's going on in here and figure out how your goal is a lot more achievable using these tools. And I really, really think what it is that you're trying to build will benefit from the use of blockchain tech. So not this is not like the end of that either. You know me and you are going to keep chopping offline and chop, building chop. this out. Yeah. <laughs> chop, chop, chop. chop. Yeah, bro. I mean, this shit is really, you know, it is what it is, though. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to get into it. Um, I think it's bound to happen because at the end of the day, this is my life. I, I chose to dedicate my life to this. And um, that's the space that I'm trying to create for people, for people that really want to, you know, dive into something. That's what Coterie is supposed to be. Um, it can be flashy or it cannot be flashy. It can be an outlet source of income. But I just kind of wanted to make a, a place where everyone can have this mutual respect of each other without it being so damn exclusive. And, you know, but that's why I like how everyone's doing their brands now. I feel like Coterie. Sometimes that doesn't even need to be a thing, you know. It just things just kind of happen. You look at TikTok. TikTok is is booming. Instagram's trying to catch up. TikTok has completely democratized attention. You can be in your damn PJs and be viral. Like it's just different now, and um, that's another reason why I've probably fallen back off of it. You know, like I said, there's pros and cons to why I stopped, but you're finding your footing, and that's. That that's that's all like you know I don't I don't expect anything of it I don't expect some like, it's like oh you have to go build this I think it's more just increasing that awareness making yeah. sure that you know some of these other avenues seeing some of these other inspiring people that have similar goals and beliefs as you and what they're building and just increasing that exposure because there's never been an opportunity in our lifetimes for this type of um, I mean, wealth establishment, really. Yeah, where, it's great, bro. Yeah, like, great. that is the, we have not had the opportunity and we do now. So it's important that I do all that I can, especially for the people that I see so much in, to make sure that they have as many tools at their disposal to build whatever the fuck it is they want to build. Because yeah. it's not always about the money. It's not always about the community. It's going to be about something different for everyone. But that why. Once I, if I can help people figure out that why and then how to actualize on it, then no, yeah, my, like is, my my goal is met. This is real. This is like, I mean, this reminds me of, of Instagram, but this is like way more tangible, and um, and free. You know, Instagram. Nobody knew like there's dudes that I know that have blown up now that I'm still cool with, but when we were in high school about seven eight years ago, they were paying money to promote their posts and shit like everybody was like oh that's whack as hell like why is he you know who is this motherfucker like why is he doing that i know him why is he promoting it next thing you know like 
Instagram baddies take off. Like, shit just starts <laughs> popping off, bro. And, like, I feel like this is a similar thing. Um, the same thing just happened with YouTube. Like, YouTube's been around, but these YouTube celebrities are, like, in a whole, like, celebrity Whole other stratosphere, yeah. I don't even get it. Like, it's... But they exist, bro. And they all started by just vlogging fucking nothing like yeah we don't we don't know where this space is going to lead to but i can guarantee it's going to make bigger celebrities than bigger personalities that yeah than we've seen out of instagram youtube or tiktok the people that emerge at the top of this space yeah it's, yeah it's, it's going to be different it's going to be different no yeah so it's on that bad. note my g yeah, I appreciate you, you know, joining me, chopping up. This has been easily, easily, very much a conversation I was looking forward to, but it flowed super smooth. We're clearly way over another person that I could talk to for hours <laughs> about what we have going on. I have a thing where at the end of every episode, I ask people what their seed phrase is. So seed phrase in like crypto blockchain terms is your recovery key. And I always say the recovery key is not scary. I mean, seed phrase is not scary enough of a term for a recovery key. Like if I lose my seed phrase, I lose access to all my crypto and my NFTs. So I want to repurpose seed phrase and I want to make it about kind of the motto or your slogan for the rainforest. And I say that, you know, my name puns, but money trees, we planted some seeds here today. How would you sum up what we talked about today. What is that motto? What is your seed phrase? See it through. I'm just. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to say it. Bro. I hit. I hit Saul earlier and was like, "Yo, these don't really have a format to them. We're just gonna get on and we're gonna chop." The only things that I ask everyone are, "What are their seed phrase?" <laughs> and what's their reserve price? And he was like, oh, can I use like someone else's? And I'm thinking, oh, he meant like like a quote or something from someone else. I'm like, hell yeah. Like, you know, somebody's used lyrics before. It doesn't have to be an original quote from you, but it's just something that you stand by. And when I said yes to that, I didn't realize he meant <laughs> literally someone else's <laughs> seed phrase. God, I loved it, bro. Because that's, I mean, that's what I'm more about. But I would like to say that um, just, you know, it's not can, it's will. You have to will things into fruition. And that that is like that pretty much summarizes my entire early adulthood. Like just willing shit, you know. And if you have parents or any mentors or anything like that. Yo, you're cutting out. Have you cut out after mentors? Oh, I was saying if you have any mentors or, or parents or anything, like and you really ask them, I think that's what it all comes down to is is you know, is willing things into fruition. And, and and just making it happen, you know, being patient and and attacking. It's not can, it's will. You have to will it into fruition. There it is, G. There it is, man. Thanks for having me. Um, happy uh, happy New Year. Um, this was truly an honor. Yo, happy New Year to you. When do you stop saying Happy New Year? I've been saying it because other people say it. You know, I don't celebrate holidays, so. I'm just going. <laughs> I'm just going off of everybody else. <laughs> I, I I I have a hard date of the fifteenth, where it's like, yo, fam, I can't keep replying in emails and in text messages. Happy New Year! Like we're we're into it. We're almost at February. We're past it. Yeah, I missed the ball. Anyway, that was a I random didn't side note. Kiss anybody? Um, I'm sorry. I'm gonna let you go. Let me end on this note, though. No, I, no, no, I, G, you're fine. You're fine. I didn't kiss anybody. I completely missed it. But then I I was just, I was so nervous because I'm like, bro, I feel like if there's anywhere for you to leave without the lips you came with, uh, it's probably New York City. <laughs> <laughs> New, New York, York City in the middle of this pandemic, bro. Come on. You made the right decision, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that would have been, you, get a little you were rolling the dice on whether or not. <laughs> <laughs> Please, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <Christopher. laughs> Thank you Oh man. I saw yeah. Yo, very last thing. What is the reserve price for your note going to be? Uh is there a minimum? No, there's no minimum. I really want to set it at like five hundred, man. 
There it yeah. is. That's cool. That's there's, cool. There's homies I, out I here think that one thing, into it, and that's all we've been talking about. I can't be setting it thousands and shit like that, man. You know. So I think that there's. It's like a double edged sword, right? Where on one hand, I want people to be able to assess their own value, right? And I don't know what the value of. Well, that's not true. I do know the value of what we're talking about here in Money Trees and this concept. But I don't think that it's on me to have to force that, right? So there is no minimum. There is no maximum. And I think that when I was saying there's two sides of it where on one end, you do want to pay people what they're worth, right? Where even with me, there's times when I've wanted to do things with you and I knew that you would rock with the vision and then I could tap you to do it. But if I couldn't compensate you for it, it put me in a weird place where I'm like, one, I don't want to ask for you to do a discount because I don't want you to have to feel like you're cheapening your work. And that's more of a me thing than anything. And on the flip side, I would say it's like, yo, I think it's up to people to set their value at whatever they see it is. And now I don't think that you value this at $500. I think that's the price that you want it to be accessible at. We've also talked about how NFTs are forever. And the cool thing is the fact that you could buy this one for 500, but whenever you do your next drop and as your career progresses, I can guarantee it will not resell for 500. That resell value will grow and you can allow the market to set your price. Where instead of starting off super high and waiting for people to say, yo, I want to collect this now because Saul is an established, you know, an opera producer designer in this space. It becomes a thing of like, yo, I, I got it early when he was still coming up, blah, 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 blah. And now he just did this collab or he just did this runway show. So I got it for 500. And the person that believed in you early is going to get a chance to flip it for way more than that later down the line. So I, I see both sides of it. I have no issue with any I'm, of the average, price. I'm just, I'm that marketing, advertising. I always have that in my back of my head, though. Like, yay. It's like, <laughs> shit's got to be accessible. But, at, I mean, I didn't drop that many dimes this conversation, bro. I mean, we, it, I kind of, you know, I didn't give all the sauce. But if I really <laughs> have to give the value, I, I can't give no, all the even, sauce. No, don't even, don't even, don't even. You don't have, that's what I mean. Like, yeah, that's not, so I, that's not what this is for or what it's about. Make it, make it, make it. Uh, no, we're not changing it. No, don't change it. Don't change it. Okay, stick, okay, stick, okay. stick with it. Stick All by right. your guns, man. That was your first thought. That was your first feel. And we rock with that. I was just adding more context where it's like I never want anyone to feel like, oh, well, why is mine cheap, you know, so much cheaper than the other ones? It's not, it's not about that at all. Different journeys, different people, and different messages being sent with that. And different Can reasoning for all five, those prices. Five, five for my angel number babies. Yeah, hell yeah, we can do that. Yeah. So it's run funny. It, run it. You five, and five, you five. and Job ja both have five five five, but your ETH price is going to be different because I I set it based off the price of ETH whenever I list it. So five hundred fifty five is going to be a little bit different than it was whenever um, Ja did his. Anyway, that was just like a random fun fact. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> all right, brother. Thank you, my man. G. I really do appreciate it. This is Yo. my first podcast. Sorry if I ruined it. Thank you very much. Ruined it. Come on, fam. This was this was cold, bro. Thank, thank you for coming you, on here. <laughs> I'm really glad we got to document this. I'm glad this got to be the first talk. You you said you didn't drop gems, but you really did because you gave people a look inside your mind, how it works, the way you approach the art. And there are going to be people that do it the same way that you do and have that same approach. And your version of this is not really represented much. And I'll say that for sure, where it's like, it's not a lot of people can step back, admit that they're stepping back and why they're stepping back and be okay with that. So stand on that shit, man. You're ill. I think I went this whole show without saying ill till just now. So kudos to me. I want to do a counter once there's like a lot more viewers and I'm going to start like um like little fun mini games where it's like oh, yo yeah. if you um however many times i say if i repeat a word like you tell me whatever word i repeated the most i'm gonna like give like rewards or something for that so i can stop doing that <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're like yo you said shit and fuck this many times and i'm like 
I we're getting rid of it. No more of that. Never again. Anyway, yeah, it's clearly where the the quality is is like. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for coming out uh, to listen to this. Y'all, y'all some goats. Hey, early days, so. My G, stay blessed. Please get settled. You've had a wild time these last few days.